joining us here again this weekend at Mad Monster Party 2015. Gunner, you just finished your photo op. Yeah. What was that like? I forgot how much that chainsaw weighed. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the. Oh, and I'm 40 years old. <laughs> and so that's the first time in 40 years that you put on the mask. I put anything. I've done no costume for 42 years. Did it feel, did you get feel right back in the character with it, or? Uh, it's real funny wearing it. I, um, when we were shooting it, I had worked so hard on the character that it was very easy for me to use my posture to go into the character. It, that was all gone. I mean, it, it was none of that. I, Realized right away what I that I had to do a certain posture to make him look like the face, but uh, that's why I was I had my head tilted over and I was drooling. You know. <laughs> but no, I, I mean I, I wondered about that, and um, it was not like the old magic came back. It just it felt like I was wearing a very strange outfit. <laughs> Now, is that something you think you might ever do again, or the people who took part in that? Is that a once-in-a-lifetime thing that they just experienced there? Well, I don't know. Uh, it took a lot of persuading to do, for me to do it this time. And there's a possibility I might do it again. I, I don't know. I just have to think about it. And if I do, I don't know. I, I, I'd probably wear a different, I'd probably wear like a pretty woman with the coat, so at least it's a whole different, you know, drag. Now, out there, how many of you took part in the photo op? What was your thoughts going on in your mind while you were up there? Holy shit, it's Leatherface. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, last year marked the 40th anniversary of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, I guess we want to begin with you, Gunner. How you uh, auditioned for it began, how you became affiliated with the movie. Uh -huh. Well, you know, it's funny because I... I got this role because I had been in Of Mice and Men in college. And I ended up in a conversation with a friend of mine from the play a couple of years later. And a friend of his joined the conversation and said, gee, it's too bad, you know, they, there are these guys in town making a horror movie and you would be perfect to play the killer, but they've already cast the movie. And then about two weeks later, I ran into him on the street and he said, um, the guy they hired is holed up drunk in a motel. And they're looking again. So I called the casting guy and went down and had a very vague meeting with, uh, with uh, the casting just to, you know, let me know what it was about. He wouldn't tell me much or anything. And then he called me a couple of days later. I went down and met Toby and uh, and uh, and, Lincoln. and uh, the casting was essentially an hour of conversation where they explained the character and his personality and his relationship. So he gave me all the backstory. And then Toby said, are you, he said, are you violent? And I said, no, I'm not violent in the least. And he said, well, are you crazy? And I said, you fucking idiot. <laughs> I, I said, no, I'm not crazy in the way you mean it. And then he said, well, can you do it? And he had this boring look in his face. I said, oh, yeah, be easy. And he said, all right, you're in. you got the part. And that's when I first had my first inkling of, you know, method director, method actor. And uh, later, when I signed the contract, I asked him why he, did, why he picked me. And he said, well, you filled the door when you came to the dinner. And I realized that it had nothing to do with talent or my convincing him of anything. It had everything to do with the fact that I was the biggest guy you ever did. And, and so it also confirmed the lesson I've long learned over the years, which is when you're being cast, lie. Can you swim like a fish, <laughs> like a French fish? <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, just lie, and if you have to speak French, well, you can figure out how you're going to do that. And it's the same with Chainsaw. I mean, I didn't know how I was going to play that at all. Now, Bill, can you talk a little bit about how you auditioned for the part and how you came to be Leatherface for part two? Uh, I went through a casting call. Uh, they were doing pre-production in Austin, Texas. They had a national. Uh, casting called out. They hadn't uh, cast uh, Leatherface yet. I got a call. Come in, go do this. It's for Chainsaw Massacre, and I had not seen it. So I went up and saw it that night. 
bolted all the doors and locked all the windows. <laughs> it's a creepy and scary movie. Um, well, I felt more disturbed and frightened than scared. It was creepy. So, uh, went into the audition. I didn't have any lines. They gave me a board about this long. This is your saw. And uh, it was an actress that came. Intimidated. Seemed relatively simple, so they liked what I was doing. They had me come back. Uh, Ted Carson, writer, did it for him. Yeah, okay, and then the third time, Toby showed up and with uh, Caroline. So I don't know what else to tell you. I guess they like my body English. <laughs> now, had they approached you, Gunner, about coming back for a second one? Or just not interested at that point. Oh, no, I was very interested. They did approach me and asked me if I would be interested, and I said yes. And it, you know, it just came down to money. Um, not to flog a dead horse, but, you know, we all know the story of how the original cast never made any money. So this new production comes up, and can you hear me in the back without the mic? Okay, I'll use the mic. This new production comes up, and they call me, and they offer me scale plus 10%. And I said, well, what's the 10% for? And they said, well, for your agent. And I said, well, actually, I don't have an agent. And I said, but you're gonna have to offer me more. I won't do it for scale. Uh, and I said, just think about what you think I'm worth to the movie and then off, make me an offer that reflects that. And, and the irony of it is, if they'd offered me like scale plus $100 a week, I would have grabbed it. All I wanted was some little acknowledgement. So after like, Two weeks, they come back. I guess they're trying to make me nervous by waiting that long. They come back and say, okay, we, the offer stands at scale. I said, what happened to the 10%? And they said, well, you don't have an agent, you don't need that. So I realized that they, they, they weren't negotiating at all. They were not interested in having any conversation. It was just as it stood. And I said, well, it's clear to me I'm not gonna be in the movie. So that's why, I mean, I would have been interested in doing it. It's just they weren't gonna pay me, so. No. Why would, you know, having done the first movie and having it be the success it was, now years later, you, at that point, you were that character, so why would they just approach you with just, here, we're just gonna give you the bare minimum we can give you? Did they look at it as like, oh, well, you don't have any lines, you're just, you're there, is that? Yeah, I think so, I mean, I think, I think they treat it like Godzilla, you know? It's a guy in a rubber suit, how much acting can there be? I, I mean, I really feel like that was the attitude. And you know, a few years, I don't know if it was about 1976 or 77, there was an attempt to do a second chainsaw, which was a group, an investor group in Chicago, and I talked to one of the producers who was interested in having me play a Leatherface again. So this was maybe four or five years before the, the second one was actually made. And he, I said, I am interested. I said, but you have to understand before we talk about money, I need to be paid more than you can and he said the words that I think explain everything. He said, listen, there are guys out there who look more like you than you do. And I think that was exactly the attitude. You all, and I think this is an attitude about many actors in general, you're interchangeable parts. Uh, as long as it's, you know, you don't have a face that we can, that we need to see. So they don't realize it's not just the appearance, it's the mannerisms and the work yeah, that you put clearly, into it. Yeah, clearly when, when they cast Bill, they wanted to see a character, a representative, they wanted to see a Leatherface that was convincing. They wanted to, they had specific ideas about what they, I'm assuming they did, they wanted a certain Leatherface, you, you had to like, I mean, you had three cast calls, which means they were studying to see who could play the part the best play the part they wanted the best of the characterization. So, uh, but they basically, I don't think they wanted any actor to feel like he had any leverage, I think as much as, I mean, that's why they waited two weeks before they, before they called me back. Now, I'm just curious between, um, you know, both of you having worked with Toby on the various movies, the different, each of your experiences working with Toby, you on the first one and, and Bill on the second one, I can't do a comparison. Uh, your, your experience. My experience with Toby uh, 
really a, a person who's highly concentrated, focused, uh, knows what he wants, uh, I would say introverted a great deal, um, pretty fierce, and knew what he wanted and knew how to do it. He directed me a lot from off camera, which I was really grateful for. Yeah, do this, do that, do that, yeah, that's it. And so, this is what I'm thinking, you know, and yeah. So, uh, he got exactly what he wanted from, from me, I presume. And he, uh, I mean, he was, he's the light, he's um, an eccentric kind of guy. I mean, he has his quirks and he's so solid. And you know, like how you have a cat or several cats, they're all so much them, but they're all different. And so he would come in and with this briefcase and get out his cigar and his assistant would be popping the Dr. Pepper and sliding in the Dr. Pepper holster on his directing chair and the guy would come with this lighter and light him up and now I'd be rolling in, all right, let's get a rehearsal in here. So I really liked that he liked to rehearse and uh, he, had a, he had a system and he had it down and uh, he had a lot of pressure on him from the beginning to get it done on time because they had sold this puppy already. It was, you know, slated to be on the screen by a by a particular date. So that was that was a huge guillotine hanging over the heads of all the uh, the fellows back in L.A. They had sent con mostly was telling me uh, one night uh, some limo showed up. A guy came out, went over to the table, director's table, picked up the script, grabbed some pages. No, you don't have a schedule. And turned around and left. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I have found the place. So, uh, so they were they really had a lot of pressure on Toby. Uh, Kit Carson, the writer, by the way, I thought that script was, I mean, that was a really good script. I mean, the language in that, and that, and the particular quirks in that family. It was pretty sweet. He told me that uh, Toby's, uh, they had tried to fire Toby twice. Uh, he put somebody else in his place because they didn't like the way the speed was going. Uh, Toby had, uh, I guess, run over 20 weeks on the, the previous film, which is a long time. And they just couldn't afford to have that happen, I suppose. However, uh, is the strength of his contract kept him on. So the pressure, they kept the pressure on him. So they had sent in a B recording crew, B camera team. And for some reason, while uh, the A team were uh, setting up, getting ready to do a scene, the B team was just next nearby, making a hell of a lot of rocket and ruckus, and uh, Toby just went flippo. It was really great, because he was like a little volcano. He stormed over there and he screamed over to him in beautiful blue language. And <laughs> where are the fucking A team over here? God damn it. <laughs> they shut that shit down real quick, too. <laughs> he was the director and he didn't mean maybe. <clears throat> and uh, we were all fired up. Man, we thought this is excellent. You know, we really got a sense of uh, the fire of. Uh, fire in the belly of where the, the hell the, the craziness was coming from in the script. And I think that's the night Bill Mosley was uh, hammering LT's uh, head with the hammer and blood was spurting for hours and Toby kept going, yeah, let's do another one. So I thought, take 20. Bill said, am I doing something wrong, Toby? Oh no, no, I'm having a great time. Let's do it again. <laughs> I think we, uh, we kind of bonded somehow, uh, unspoken. Uh, definitely felt a lot of affection for him and a lot of trust to do uh, to do this the kind of very vulnerable, dark stuff that that Gunner originated. Was uh, got to be.
be able to trust the people you're with so you can uh, find your way back where it's safe. Um, working with Toby was interesting because he was really easy to work with. I, I felt like he, he never lost his temper, you know, he just ground out. I mean, there was a point that I found out later in the scene where they're at the gas station and the really strange guy comes in the bucket and he's flushing. Um, at one point, uh, when he's got the windshield look soaked up, uh, Alan Danziger, who is Jerry, the van driver, accidentally hit the windshield wiper button and loaded a whole load of water across the windshield right into uh, uh, his face. <laughs> Which meant we had to stop. They had to stop because they had to, you know, dry them off and put a fresh shirt on. And what happened was uh, everybody got the giggles after that. This is, I wasn't there for that, but uh, that's what I was told by different several people that they just couldn't finish the shot. And Sto Toby finally swore at them and stormed off. And uh, I think I think Danny Pearl, the DP, finished that shooting that that scene. But that's the only thing I ever heard of, and certainly working with him myself, he was he was real exacting as a director. He knew exactly what he wanted, and he worked very hard at. For us, it wasn't so much rehearsing scenes as we would walk scenes because we'd block them out and we'd get because he wanted to get the camera motion exactly right, so that once we shot everything, all the pieces of. There were scenes where the cameras moved in three different directions in one take, and he said, well, I, I want to do it this way because I could shoot it really quick in pieces and cut it together, but it wouldn't look the same. It'd be a, it, so he was very specific about that. But on the other hand, unlike your experience, he didn't direct the actors very much. Uh, the only direction I got was he said, when you run to the window, you're upset. Where are these people coming from? That was the only directing I got. And Ed Neal told me that um, the only direction he got was, you know, when he was capped, when he was being interviewed for the during the casting, he said, Can you do weird? And Ed went into his he channeled his schizophrenic nephew, that's what he did. He just did an imitation of his schizophrenic nephew. And he got the part and he said, the only directing I ever got was my first day on set. As we're about to start shooting, Toby says to me, that Striller Murphy thing you do. So all of us loved that. We loved the fact that we, he just left us alone. You know, we made our lives a lot easier in the sense that every we all wanted to feel free. I mean, we knew the characters we wanted. So that maybe I guess changed over time. But otherwise, he was very exacting, and he, you know, it was clear he really had a clear idea of what he wanted the film to be visually. But he focused his energies how he was going to block a shot, how he was going to frame a shot, where the camera was going to go, and not how did you read that line. And a great example is, you ruin the door. We did like five or eight takes of that, that line, and we used the worst, the worst reading of the line. You ruin the door. It was the worst reading, but it was visually what he wanted as far as wherever everything was. And so yeah, Bill, Bill uh, Mosley asked, uh, you, what direction would you like, Toby? And he Toby said, eh, just do that crazy chop top stuff. <laughs> now, Bill, can you talk a little bit, when, when you were cast as Leatherface, did you, how much did you look to Gunner's performance? Or did you reach out to Gunner at all? Or did you want to try to make it as much your own as possible? Um, the script was, it's a different universe, you know, it's a parallel universe. And after watching uh, the first one in Gunn's performance, I thought, well, there's a masterpiece that ain't gonna be beaten. It doesn't need, it doesn't need anything. It's not, it's, I just couldn't see trying to imitate Gunner, because A, Gunner, Gunner's leather face was not in display anyway. So I, but I did get inspired by uh, his performance and uh, got a, a lot of actor stuff from it. And, uh, and went in with the relying on the, uh, the 
cooperation and, and collaboration of the cast with, with Jim, because Jim was a common factor between uh, both our movies. So there was a lot there. And then, of course, Bill, he was, he was redlining the entire thing. <laughs> and, you know, he was pedal to the metal the whole time. So playing off of him. So that was, uh, I guess, the extent of my uh, uh, research, I suppose. I didn't know better at the time. And uh, I didn't think a phone call would really make any difference. And especially, I had a sense that <clears throat> this actor probably wanted to do this role. <laughs> in his, in, and I don't want to call him. So, I think it's you were right to decide that it's a different universe. Let me create my own little universe because it's clear that it is a different universe, and the the character as written is a very different character mm -hmm. anyway. So I I would agree that that was the smartest way to approach it is to say, how am I going to? What is the other face I'm going to? That, that was the best approach to it. Um, I did want to add that I asked Bill one time, uh, uh, Moses, uh -huh. uh, how in the world did you memorize those lines? And I'm sure you know this. He goes, oh, you can't memorize those lines. He said, I just made that up off the top of my head as I read it. <laughs> it's all just, he said, it just came out as bladder. Yeah, you know, Bill was an English major and a writer, and uh, and Toby was very uh, uh, liked improvisation a lot. And Bill uh, was he had a lot to supply because we were we spent a lot of time waiting, and so we were we were brothers waiting uh, to get on that set. And so we developed a lot you know a lot of uh, sort of backstory for ourselves. Yeah. Now, Gunnar, one of the things that's really most horrifying about the movie is the realism and the violence, and in particular the scene where, where Pam, uh, played by Terry, uh, you, you lift her up and lower her on her onto the hook on her back. Can you talk a bit about creating a scene that looks like that, but the, 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 um, the energy and effort that goes into creating that realism? Sure, I mean, it's not... You know, you don't have me to thank for that, obviously, it's Toby. Uh, and it's an interesting scene because I, I meet so many people who say, I saw that hook go into her back. And I, want, and I do say, mm -hmm. <laughs> And if you look at the scene, it's such a simple scene the way we shot it, and the, the shooting worked so well because it's a series of quick cuts, they're only like, in that point where Leatherface lifts, you know, where she breaks away. So you, from the point where he comes in with her and puts her on the hook, you know, that seven or eight seconds, it's like five separate shots. But they cut together so fast you don't realize it, that you have a shot where the, the camera is up high and it's like a point of view shot of the hook. The camera is up high in the corner and the hook is in the foreground of the shot and you're looking past the hook at her, at her back. Then you cut to from behind Leatherface as he starts to lift her up. And then you get a shot where her back is approaching as he lifts her up, as her back is approaching the hook. Again, you know, that way. Then you cut back and I go, boom. So it's a quick little series of takes, and you're convinced you saw the hook go in, but you didn't because the way they did it was on that last take, they turned the hook around. So the point of the hook is facing away from her. She's got a harness on uh, with a, a cable that comes up and a, and a little loop. So I pick her up, we thread the loop, the little eyelet, on the shaft of the hook, so when I drop her, the eyelet is on the cable, drops down, and it hits the bottom of the hook and stops, which stops her because it's attached to the harness. So it looks like she just went under the hook, but of course the hook point is pointing away from her. So boom, it looks like she just went out. 
So you see that, you know, pat, 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 and your fingernails as you walk to that. And it's a clean little sequence that they don't linger on. It's all in real time. Uh, so you end up thinking, you know, and the what, sound was really clear too. Yeah. <laughs> but the, it's a real interesting thing because even today, when that movie first came out, uh, a third of the theater at that point just got up and walked out. And it was consistent. And I was watching a screening of it down in, in Austin. I'm not in Austin, I'm in Kingsland at the, the original house. And uh, we had a barbecue and this outdoor screening and it, everybody there had seen the movie. And when, when, when uh, Kirk gets hit uh, with the hammer, Slam. The whole place goes up in an uproar of cheers and laughter and clapping, and everyone's so happy. And then inevitably, then you know, four minutes later, or whatever it is, she goes on the hook, and the place falls dead silent. And they knew; they all knew exactly what was happening. They'd watched it twenty times, but it's still so effective that it just stops everybody for it. It's just you know, such a shocking thing that they didn't see. And you immediately that tape you do to the door. And you slam that door shut like a, like God's thunder itself. Didn't that was the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> All day it wasn't the drugs. Uh, no, yeah, that was because I was. Uh, that was my first appearance on camera. That I this, and I was so charged up on adrenaline that first I hit him in the head with the hammer. It was a fake hammer, but I actually gave him a black eye. And then I was supposed to just drag him out of the way of the door and, and slam the door, close the door. And we had pillows set up around the corner so that I was just supposed to drag him out of the way and drop him in the pillows and close the door. But I actually picked him up and threw him. So he went right past the pillows and hit the far wall at first, but he landed very comfortably on those pillows. And then I was so charged up at that point, I just slammed that door. And it looks like it's really heavy, but it weighs almost nothing just a two by four frame with a one piece of cross bracing in it and then sheet metal. But the way it was made, it slid into a slot and the slot wasn't quite perfectly made. So there was some friction there, so it jammed. So it goes wham and it doesn't bounce. Normally it would bounce a little bit because it didn't weigh anything. But because it jammed, it looked like it weighed 600 pounds because it goes wham, it just stops. So it was again a sort of unintended illusion that it weighed much, weighed, that it weighed a ton. But the reason it happened that fast was because I was so charged up on adrenaline that I just was out of control. And I just, poor Bill. You know, when I, when, he, when I threw him into the wall and slammed the door, I found out later, the producer came running in from the side thinking I had just killed <laughs> And uh, Bill Bale, and, Said he had images of the lawsuits themselves ending the production. <laughs> now, if I remember correctly, you didn't, you, in between takes, you kind of kept yourself at a distance from the rest of the cast and crew, correct? Yes, this was uh, Toby at his best method directing. He told me that the actors who played the victims wanted to be genuinely frightened when they first encountered me on camera. So they didn't want to be around me at all. And my reaction was, and I had just enough experience, you know, to think I knew what I was saying, doing, but I, I thought, it, it, it doesn't have to be real to be realistic. Uh, so I thought that was really a shame that they really thought that's what acting was, that you just get up on camera. Louder and talk. She didn't like me when I had the mask on. She would get very frightened. But just if we just sitting and I had to pull garb on, as long as the mask wasn't on. So that was my closest friend on the set. And I kept thinking of Frankenstein. I kept thinking, when do I drop her into the well? <laughs> now, Bill, did you did you have any experience like that? Was there was there an intent to keep you distanced from the other cast members? I don't know if there was someone's I thought, I started to suspect after seven weeks of coming in, getting in full costume, and going in my trailer and waiting for the first
first call, and uh, the, the second AD typically comes in and tells you when your shot's coming up. Tell me, okay, shot's coming up in half hour. I mean, half hour. Okay, uh, we're pushing it back. Uh, it'll be another half hour, and this kept happening. Okay, go to lunch. Uh, your shot's up after lunch. Uh, then he came in, uh, no, we're. So this kept, uh, and then we go to dinner. You're after dinner. Uh, shots up. No, nope, we're gonna shift you back. Okay, uh, climb out of your, climb out of your costume. We're wrapping up. So this went on for seven weeks. Same routine. They were prob probably trying to drive me crazy, but I was in air conditioning. I like being alone. Uh, red. <laughs> I mean, the first couple of weeks I slept trying to get used to the schedule because we were shooting at night and I hadn't switched over. So that was really fortunate. I think it was trying to make me get crazy, I suppose. Uh, but that was easy enough to do without having to, you know, get prodded. Again, you were getting paid? Yeah, I was getting paid still. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, for me was, I mean, that was a bunch of money. Back then, that was real Hollywood dollars. Um, and plus, uh, after a while, uh, Bill would come in and we'd play Jim Rummy, sing music, you know, play music, sing, scream at Bobby to fucking get us in front of the camera. <laughs> um, uh, they had a lot of action stuff, so I think we were shooting a lot of Bob Elmore stuff that did the, you know, my, my double. They flat wore him out. You ever see Bob give him a salute? Because the thrills, you know, he's the guy that busted through that wall in the radio station. I'd like to take claim for this, but I'm not gonna. He did it, and he rocked. Because he was brutal. Vicious and brutal, just like he should have been. On the other hand, I was Bubba, who was in love. <laughs> I wanted to experience that. And he's the only leather face that went against the family. And he was pretty much, you know, the uh, the Luca Brazzi of the family, you know, uh, except in that one. Now, last year, of course, marked the 40th anniversary of the original movie, and there were several screens that were done of the brand new 4K restoration, and you attended several of those, correct? Or one no, of them? I did one not. Of them. Well, I did a couple of screenings that were not through the mm -hmm. production company, okay. but that. Uh, there were a couple of film festivals that invited me to come down and introduce the film and talk to Felix Lieberman. So. What was it like uh, watching it again 40 years later? What was the, were, were the reactions the same as the first time you experienced people watching it? I didn't. I didn't watch it again. <laughs> oh, so you just introduced it, yeah? Yeah, because I, I know the movie so well that it just seemed like I don't I don't really want to sit through the movie. So what I did was I introduced it each time, the two times I did it, and then watch the opening credits, and then I came in a few minutes before the end because I was curious about, you know, I just went out in the lobby, you know, got drunk on Diet Coke. <laughs> and then I come in a few minutes before the end because I wanted to see the color of the film. I wanted to see just technically how the new film looked, which it was wonderful, it was beautiful. Um, but I didn't, I had just finished this book on Maple Chainsaw, and I had watched the movie at home on the DVD over and over again. I probably watched it five, six, seven times during the period of nine months of writing the book. Plus all the times I would go to a scene and have a stopwatch in place, hit the stopwatch, play, hit the stopwatch, to break down how, some, how a lot of the scenes were. And I just thought, I can close my eyes and just from listening I know exactly what's going on. So I just had no real urge to see it. So I'm a very bad one. To answer any of that, but I didn't participate in any of the promotion of the. Uh, I mean, I, they, I would have loved to, but they weren't interested in it. Um, in terms of your book, uh, which does an incredible job of correcting stories which were notorious for being off, as as, as you put it, can you talk a little bit about about deciding to sit down and, and sort of setting the record straight on the making of the movie? What is the title of that book? Uh, Chainsaw Mon Amour. Uh, no, 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 that's not. <laughs> it's called Chainsaw Confidential. 
how we made the world's most notorious horror movie. And uh, I thought about doing it on and off for a long time, and finally a, a publisher approached me and said, I'd like to do a biography of you, I, and we put your byline on it, but I'll have one of my writers write it. And I thought, well, that's a really dumb idea, because I write for a living, you know, so. But that got me started thinking about it, so I decided it was a good time to do it. And, and once I started thinking about writing the book, my whole, I, I mean, I, I wanted to have a point of view and an approach, and I realized that the, the approach that made sense for me was to look at the film in term, in the framework of all the myths and fairy tales about that movie. So what I did was the opening of the, of the book is basically the fairy tale. This is what people think the story of Chainsaw Massacre is. And then I said, none of this is true. And here now is the real story of me. Because there are so many, there's so much misinformation about, um, uh, about who we were, about what, what happened on the set. Uh, so I, that's why I wanted to approach it that way. Now, I'd like to go ahead and open up the audience question portion. If anyone has any questions, you can either from your seat or if you want to go to the microphone, you can. Uh, we'll go right here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, John, for creating and uh, Carson was rewriting all the time. He had his portable typewriter manual, and he was typing up pages. We had the colors of the rainbow, and then the alternate rainbow colors in, the, in our script. And just before uh, Jim went on the set to do the, the speech about uh, the family history of Grandpa, the Atlas Meatpacking, first came the glory and then the shame. It was a really long speech. Chief was going off to, to uh, the set and he went, here you go, here's a new scene for you. And so between the time uh, he had handed it to, to Jim and the time they uh, rolled the cameras, he had memorized two pretty good paragraphs. I thought that was pretty far out <laughs> to do that and to do with it what he did. It was... You know, and this guy is so lovely. You know, he just kind of sit around and be charming, and tell jokes, be friendly, and show you paintings. He loved to paint, and uh, he was a calming presence, a very calming presence, which is very different than his characterization. Another, you know, another uh, kudo to his acting ability. The thing about Jim was he was really kind-hearted. He. Uh... You know, in the scene in the first one where the cook beats Sally with the broom. Uh, again, I, I heard this from Marilyn because I wasn't, I was there at the beginning of the scene to finish the chase, but then I left and I went home. And was, when they first shot that, uh, they had a balsa wood broom and it just didn't look convincing at the time. And so they told the client, they said, we, this isn't gonna work, we gotta change that. Use the real broom handle. And Toby, you know, you know, Jim said, well, no, no, no. So, okay, so he's whacking her with a broom, but he's really not hitting her, he's pulling every punch. And Toby says, that it's totally unconvincing, hit the girl. <laughs> As, and that's the way Marilyn said it, said, he said, hit the girl. He didn't say, hit Marilyn, it was hit the girl. And Jim didn't want to do it. And finally, Marilyn leaned in and said, Jim, just get, let's get this over. So poor Jim, in that scene, is actually hitting her full force with a broom handle, and he knocked her unconscious. And 
it was the most horrible thing for Jim because he was such a kind-hearted man, he couldn't bear the idea that he had done this to him. But it was like, you, there's some drunks in this. <laughs> but, you know, but that was typical of Jim, you know. He, he could be convinced to do what had to be done, but man, it just broke his heart to do anything that made people feel bad uh, or hurt anybody. And I think that was Jim, you know, he was such a sweetheart. Right uh, Ed Neal once told me a story that on the set of the original Chainsaw, a woman showed up with a platter of marijuana brownies. And unbeknownst to you, Gunner, you ate the entire plate and then had a bad trip. Is there any validity to that story? Well, yes. <laughs> and no. It was the cake. Okay. And the way it worked, because we had no money, Anything that the caterer brought for lunch, whatever was leftovers, was craft services, our snacks during the shoot. And so she brought, I mean, the guy who owned this property we were filming on was growing two acres of marijuana, <laughs> which I never knew. I was out in the field every day running and I never knew it was marijuana. There was an afternoon smoker almost every day at the end of the shoot, people on the back porch talking up. I never knew. You know, and I had no objections at all. But what happened was, apparently, somebody harvested a little bit, and she came out with a flat of marijuana brown as part of lunch. And everybody knew it wasn't like anybody was being, you know, uh, hidden. I mean, it wasn't hidden. It was nobody was being deceived. We all knew it was marijuana brownies. So we ate, and we all had a, a you know, brownie. And we all got a little buzz, but then the problem was that as the day went on, you're hungry. So you go to see what there is to eat. And most movies, craft services is basically sugar. I mean, it's like everybody's just popping something in their mouth to get their sugar level up for the next 10 minutes. So everybody kept eating the brownies. <laughs> and I, I found out later that the editor showed up on set and the producer, production manager showed up on set and they were the only people who were not stoned. <laughs> and there was always so much discussion anyway that it had rethink took forever. Well, now we were all like, what? <laughs> now, a lot of the people I talked to deny being stoned during this, so I won't disagree with them. But I know the production manager was livid. <laughs> We've got to get this movie shot. So, I was on the front porch waiting for the scene where Leatherface cuts the front door, kicks it open, and comes in. And I was so wasted. I was sitting on the front porch with my, on a chair with my sort of pitched back on the back legs of the chair, my feet up on the rail. And I, I had a good friend from college who was there visiting the shoot for that day. And he swears I was sitting there saying, time has no meaning. Time has no meaning. Because that was what the shoot was anyway, you know. So anyway, I got the, I got up to do the scene, and my job is, they, we got two cameras for that shot. There's a camera out in the dark, and then there's a camera, the primary camera's on the floor on a hi-hat, a short stand that's actually on the floor in the hallway. So I, what I was supposed to do was cut the door, kick it in, step in, look for Marilyn this way, and then realize that she's gone up the steps and then go chase her up the stairs. Well, I, I had, and I, I was really worried that I was gonna kick the door in and step in and then forget to, to spot her and go up the stairs empty. Well, what happened was when I kicked the door in and stepped in, the camera man was so stoned that he jumped up and ran off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he left the camera on the floor running. But he was gone, and if you watch me, you see Leatherface go, <laughs> oh! And I turned around the stairs, and that's actually me being very stoned, trying to remember I was supposed to go upstairs. That's <laughs> right. I think we have time for two more questions. Yeah, right back there, you have your hand up.
Caroline was uh, incredibly uh, open and courageous about the stuff she had to go through uh, as a character and uh, very supportive of, of me uh, and encouraging uh, of, of me as an actor to, to do what needed to be done. So she gave me a lot of cues, not, you know, uh, nonverbal cues to uh, connect with her in, in, in the way that the script uh, demanded. So uh, it was a, a hunt and peck process, and we had a kind of simpatico. We're good friends still, and uh, she comes to visit in Austin uh, every now and then. So we, we just had a, a kind of a, a simpatico that uh, worked very well, and uh, also, I think generally speaking, when an actors are, are working well, a lot of times they don't know what the hell they're doing. They have an idea, and then they say, well, wouldn't you do this? When, when did I do that? You know, sometimes you don't remember things, so, which is, which is good. Unconscious uh, stuff can really be really uh, powerful and interesting. So, uh, I feel pretty lucky that uh, somehow got through this and uh, it turned out good. And one more, let's go ahead and side room. I just want to go um, uh, with a question she asked. Was it in the script or did you improvise the uh, chainsaw hunting? Scene? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> the ice that's tub not, scene, not yes. Where yeah, it it's always six o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elmore had just come in um, raving uh, with the saw and slammed it down into the ice tub. Cut! <laughs> like, and, I, I, and I came in. So uh, I wasn't exactly sure of, of specifically what to do, but Toby was there saying he was micromanaging. All right, get the saw. Lift this slowly. Try to slow. Touch your leg. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Slowly move it up. Uh huh. That's right. That's good. Lick those lips. That's it. Get those lips going. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh huh. Okay. So now stop. You think you hear somebody? No. It's terrific. And uh, it's it's like he's reading uh, the uh, you know graphic novel to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, roll the girls, spread your legs now, okay. He says, yeah, careful with that sauce, too low, get it up a little higher. And uh, as Caroline said uh, to someone who asked her about, what did you, how did you feel about uh, the chainsaw in your nether regions? <laughs> Caroline said, fine, that chainsaw never touched my nethers. <laughs> So that was the, uh, and Caroline was, was really urging me as an actor to, to go for it. So, because uh, she was pretty dang fearless, as you may well as you know. And, uh, she ended up, you know, toasting chopped off at, on the top of Chainsaw Mountain, so, and wailing, you know, with, with the family song. I thought that was a really nice, brave new world ending in that story. Well, I would like to thank you both for joining us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause for Gunnar Hansen and Bill Johnson.